6 through 15. This is Paul, of course, writing to the church in Corinth. The second letter that we have, uh, we, we know that there probably were many more letters of Paul's that didn't survive, so we don't know that he only wrote two letters to Corinth. He probably wrote a lot more, but this is the second one that we have. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies the seed for the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you've proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Amen. I think we probably should just leave it right there. <laughs> I don't think I'm qualified to comment on that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give it the old uh, seminary try. <laughs> I'll call it a college try. <laughs> okay. Well, as I often say, everything goes back to Genesis, right? So the book of Genesis tells us that God created us in his own image. And it pleased God when he created you and me to make us with unique characteristics and personal giftedness. Now, I believe that these are a part of God's image in us that's arranged in just the way that God wanted to arrange them for his pleasure and for ours, and for others, actually. Now, some of us have the gift of being able to sing or play an instrument, and we benefited that from that with Val and Ken this morning, while others, you know, we can't carry a tune in the bucket. You know? <laughs> some of us can look at a beautiful flower and duplicate it in oil or watercolor, mm -hmm. while others can't even draw a picture of a flower better than a three-year-old. That's, that's me. <laughs> so, yeah. Some of us have the ability to size up a situation, seeing every implication, and come to a wise decision about what action to take next. <coughs> well, most of us, I think, probably rely on the wisdom of others to guide us in making our decisions. And of course, our great source of wisdom is right here. Some of us just know naturally how to build, while others have difficulty pounding a nail straight. Some of us have the natural gift of showing others how to learn, like Jerry Chaskis. Mm -hmm. Well, some of us don't, but you know, we've profited so greatly from this talent in other people. Some of us have the ability to be good at any job we put our hand to. My father was like that. I'll tell you, it was hard living with a father who could do everything and do it well. <laughs> but he was wonderful. But some just struggled to do the same jobs. And some of us have the natural propensity to be cheerful, while others seem to have the propensity just to be negative all the time. But you know, this is how we're made, isn't it? And God made us so that our gifts would be complementary. That is, we complete one another. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, we read, Each one should use whatever gift 
he or, or she has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. So because God created us in his image, God made us to be like him. He made us to be givers. You know, God gave all this. He made us with unique gifts and talents. And he intended us to be using them so that we can be conduits of his grace. Your gifts, my gifts, everyone else's gifts not only complete us, they bring God's grace in all the ways to all the world that all the people of the world need grace. If we were all doing that, this world would be a beautiful place. Our gifts and talents are the means by which you and I can serve God and others as no one else on the planet is equipped to serve God and others. Think about that. You are a unique creation of the image of God. And as Peter said, how we use God's gifts relates to our faith. Peter mentioned that we should serve faithfully and the Apostle Paul also tied gifts, service, and faith together in Romans chapter 12. He said, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given to you. So when we've been given a special gift or a talent by God, we need to be careful not to become conceited about our gift. I think people who are in the entertainment industry must really, really struggle with that. That they have something that's so unique that nobody else has it, and they forget about who gave it to them and why God gave it to them. So when we do that, we forget that the gift really belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. He gave us natural gifts so that we can be good stewards of those gifts for him and to use them for his purposes. So Paul tied how we view our gifts to our measure of faith. Think of it this way. When God trusts you with a gift, he's also testing you with how you're going to use his gift. Are you going to use it for your own pleasure? Your own recognition? Your own gain? God bless you. Or for his? When we trust our gifts to God, faith grows. It grows and grows. But when we hold on to our gifts and we employ them for personal gain, we're not showing faith in God because we are ignoring the very purpose for which God gave us the gift. And you know what happens? <coughs> our faith becomes stunted. It starts to diminish. <coughs> and pretty soon we start to think we're God. But God, you know, he gave us these gifts, not, not just for us you know, as individuals or to be nice people helping people by doing nice things. He designed the gifts to build up the church. And so Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he was, of course, addressing the church in Rome, and he squarely put the use of gifts within the context of the church. He said, just, of, just as each of us have one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So in a general sense, God gives everyone gifts and talents that he hopes we're going to use for good. In the specific context of the church, our gifts and talents take up the very work of God. Because it is our unique attributes which together make up the complexities of this church as a whole. Just as the sum total of all the different parts of the human body make the complete and functioning body. We wouldn't be the same if we weren't all here together. Paul listed some of the gifts needed to make a healthy church body. The gift of prophecy, the gift of service, the gift of teaching, the gift of encouragement the gift of generosity, the gift of leadership, and the gift of mercy. 
If we don't have all of these gifts operating in the church, we are an incomplete body. You know, I mean, you can think about that list. Where, where, are, where are we not really doing so good? <laughs> the gift of prophecy is a tough one, isn't it? Matter of fact, we say, like, oh, prophecy, I don't want to go there. That's, that's scary stuff. You know? How do we know it's real? How do we know it's true? But if we don't have prophecy in the church, you know, we're, we're really dying. Because you know, we're not living to what God's showing us for now, and the future, and the past. Because, I mean, how much the Bible's prophecy? A lot. A lot of it. So, the gift of prophecy is needed to discern God's vision for the body. I hope that I have somewhat of a gift of prophecy. I don't have it all the time, but I have had prophecies, and I have seen them come true. But that means, doesn't mean it's just the pastor who has the gift. You all have gifts like that. I'm sure that you hear from God. And if you haven't heard from God, pray for him to speak to you. The gift of serving is like the lifeblood that flows through the whole body, keeping it alive. I think of Jerry and Pauline sitting over there. Mm -hmm. The gift of serving. Think of how what Jerry and Pauline do every week just enlivens this body. Not just because we're having a really sweet piece of cake and a nice cup of coffee. I mean, that, that kind of enlivens me. <laughs> Think of what it does in the spiritual realm. It's huge. I'm glad you're here to hear that. I'm going to go back to the office to tell you that personally. <laughs> you might get a swelled head over it. <laughs> so the gift of serving is the lifeblood. Keeps us alive. The gift of teaching, it's vital to have healthy thinking and understanding and directing of the body. You know, I, I, guess, I guess I have a gift of teaching. I mean, teaching and preaching are my gifts. I, mean, I stink at everything else, but you know, that's, that's, where, that's where I have my gifts. And I know that. And so I pour myself into my teaching and my preaching so that every week I come here, I set the table for a meal of a different kind. I can only set it. I mean, you have to decide whether you're going to want to eat. But there are other gifted teachers also. And I won't, you know, I don't want any more swelled heads in here, so I'm not going to say anybody's name. Okay? <laughs> but you know who they are. The gift of encouraging keeps the body hope-filled and joyful. I mean, some of us have that gift of encouraging. You, know, you look at somebody's face and you say, oh boy. There's something going on there today. And you go up and say, you know, you look a little down. I mean, I'm looking at Pauline. She has the gift of encouragement. She knows just what to say at just the right moment, with just the right prayer. Pauline's lifted my spirit many times. All right, I wasn't going to say anybody. I'm sorry, Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> the gift of encouragement is, is a huge one. You know, every one of us is called to contribute to the body as a whole, you know, with tangible gifts, if you will. But this gift of generosity that Paul's talking about really goes above and beyond. It addresses something beyond the day-to-day -day needs of the body of the church to reach others who need extraordinary care in the church or outside, the, and that's why we have missions, outside the church. The gift of leadership guides the body to work under the supreme leadership of the Holy Spirit. Anybody who's a leader has to be submitted to the Spirit first. We have a fine leadership core in this church. I don't know if you realize that, but, you know, I've been in enough churches and, and enough dysfunctional churches to know that we have good leaders in this church. And every one of them is immersed in the Word and in prayer and submits themselves to the Holy Spirit. That's how we benefit from their leadership. I think the greatest gift of all is mercy. Mm -hmm. Mercy enfleshes in the body of Christ the very heart of Jesus. So all of these gifts need to be present in the church if we're alive and we want to grow and we want to do God's work in the world. We can't just hoard them all here for ourselves. We, you know, we love on each other, we do. 
we need to love on them out there because it's, <laughs> in case you haven't noticed, the world is not in too good a place right now. So Paul's list is a good one, I think, of gifts. But if you don't see yourself in anyone in particular, you know, God has oh, some very unique gift that he didn't put in the list, which we can all covet. <laughs> A unique combination of gifts that he has created in each person that's known to him, and he will use those gifts. The thing that we always need to remember is that our gifts will bring the most pleasure to God and, you know, vicariously, if you will, to ourselves, actually, when we are using them for God's purposes, because it's then that we're going to bring glory to God, and then we experience the joy of God's glory as a reflection that's when our faces shine, when we're living to bring joy and glory to God. So how you use God's gifts affects the health of the church. If you're not using the gifts that God gave you for his purposes, especially within the body, the church, your faith is not going to grow, and neither will the church. And too often, we use the gifts that God gives us to profit us in our jobs and our recreational pastimes, and we give what's left over to the church. It's one of the main reasons why churches don't thrive. It's not because God hasn't given us everything we need to be a vibrant church. It's, we refuse to use what he has already given to us for his purposes. And it's only when we seek God's kingdom first and his purposes that everything else falls into the right and proper places in our lives. And we begin to truly know that we are cared for in every way that is needed. And all of those other things that we think are important kind of fall off to the wayside. God has a way of putting things in the priority of the eternity. So when we seek God's kingdom first, it's the only way that we are truly going to be content and at peace in our lives. So your attitude toward your gifts and talents are going to determine whether you're going to be a good steward of these gifts and talents that God gave you. And as Paul says, God doesn't want your service grudgingly. You know, if you can't give, to, you know, whatever it is, your time, your talent, your treasure, can't do it joyfully. Forget it. God doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. He wants you to be a channel of His joy and mercy. That's really the payoff for God. He doesn't need all that other stuff. Now, how many of you are familiar with Chuck Swindoll? I know a lot of people, you know, hear Chuck Swindoll on the, ra on the radio. Um, he wrote this about the importance of our attitudes, because it really comes down to what's the attitude of your heart. He said, the longer I live, the more I realize the importance of attitude in life. Attitude, to me, is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance or giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every single day regarding the attitude that we will embrace for that day. That speaks to me because all my life I've been a recovering pessimist, you know. <laughs> and I get up in the morning and I have to kind of decide, how, how am I going to do this day? What am I going to do? What's my attitude going to be? And I particularly love what Benjamin Franklin said, because I'm a gardener. He said this about attitude. Some people grumble because God placed thorns among the roses. Why not thank God for placing roses among the thorns? I remember that every time I you know, prick my hand and bleed when I'm in my rose bed. But yeah. Your attitude towards your gifts and talents will determine whether you're going to be a good steward of those gifts and talents. And your attitude towards your material blessings in life will also determine whether you're going to be a good steward of those blessings that God has given to you. Healthy stewardship is a way of life for the follower of Christ. Good management of God's time, you know, that's the only commodity that we can't buy, right? We can't get time back. Use your time wisely. How about the body that God's given you? How about the gifts and talents as we talked about he created in us? And the money and the material things that he has provided for us. Because don't, you know, don't fool yourselves. You, know, you didn't make that money. God made you so that you could earn 
but it is all a gift. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, who was his spiritual son and a young pastor who was personally mentored by the apostle, he's given us some wise advice about a healthy attitude toward the use of money. He said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now that's often misquoted. It's, it, it, people leave out some words of this. They say that the love of money is the root of evil. It's not. It's the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So the, when the main object of our lives is to accumulate money or stuff that money can buy, to put aside enough money so we feel safe, you know, to hoard money toward purchasing some longed-for pleasure at the expense of doing what is right with the money that we have, money for us becomes a spiritual stumbling block. Why? Because it becomes an idol. We put money ahead of God and ahead of what God intends us to use, the riches of his grace that he's given to us. So when money's our gold, it replaces God's rightful position in our lives. As Paul wrote, we come to love money as our God. So we look to money for our security and for power over situations in which we would feel vulnerable without it. You know, how many of you have a 401k or an IRA now? You, know, you feeling a little insecure about that? Mm -hmm. We may not have them much longer, but you'll have God forever. And God will take care of us. God, and only God can give us true security and power. And when our faith is placed in our money, but not in God, we falsely believe that we are taking care of ourselves. And as I said before, that's one step away from thinking that we are God. So a lot of people out there that think they're God today, don't they? They think they can recreate themselves in their own image. They can go in and have some body parts chopped off and some, you know... Hormones injected in, and they can be something else. When our God of money is jeopardized for some unforeseen catastrophe, a serious illness, the bottom falling out of the stock market. Remember 2008? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Took 10 years to get my portfolio back to where it was, you know. Uh, I don't know if I have 10 years now if it fell out. I don't care. It's not a, not a concern anymore a serious illness, the work of thieves, you know, people come and taking your stuff. Everything in the world that can separate us from our money, when we are devastated by those things, we are doing that because we do not have faith in the right things or the right person. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, we live by faith mm -hmm. and not by sight. So money has to occupy the right place in our lives. It's a blessing to us from God, no matter where it comes from, whether it's from our labors, our investments, or from gifts, or windfalls, or I hope you're not playing the lottery because um, I don't know whether God wants you to do that, but um, I personally have never bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> it's a blessing that needs to be used for God's purposes in our lives. That's why he gives us money. It's a tool to bless people with the kingdom and to take care of his workers. So I want to, I know we're running a little late today. We've got a lot actually on the plate today, but I want to emphasize a, a couple of key points from 2 Corinthians about the stewardship of money for the follower of Jesus, because that's what we are. We're, we're following the Lord, and when we follow the Lord, we have to do what the Lord shows us to do, right? So the first point, I think, is so beautiful in, in that scripture from 1 Corinthians, no, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, was that our joyful giving spills over and encourages other people. So Paul, at this point, you know, he's, he's traveling throughout Asia Minor. You know, he's an, an itinerant apostle. And he's going around and he's encouraging and teaching the churches. And throughout his missionary journey, especially in Asia Minor, you have to you know, think about the geography in those days. Asia Minor was the link between the Roman Empire and, and the Orient, if you will. All trade, east and west, went through Asia Minor. These were wealthy, wealthy cities. Jerusalem, on the other hand, was very, very poor. And so throughout his missionary journey, Paul was taking up a collection from these wealthy churches in Asia Minor and in Europe 
for their impoverished sisters and brothers in Jerusalem, at the, at the mother church, if you will. And so in this letter, Paul was writing in part about he's coming to collect this generous gift. He's, he's, coming, he's coming and he knows in advance that Corinthians have you know, put together a pretty big pot here. It's going to go back to Jerusalem. And he's you know, thanking them in advance. And it was so great, this gift. And the enthusiasm of the givers in the Corinthian church that prompted their gift, other churches in Macedonia were hearing about it, and they followed suit, and they were giving a great gift. And some of these were very poor churches, and they were giving from their hearts, not from, you know, from what they could afford. They gave profitably because of the love of God. And so what we see here in this time in the first century is when we give with the attitude that God wants us to give, with joy and enthusiasm, others will be encouraged to give too. And our joy in giving also increases. How many of you experienced joy when the amounts were, were announced that went to Maui and to Israel? From 35 people. You know, let's not get, you know, 12 heads about this, but I was like gobsmacked. <laughs> What an encouragement that is to those who receive that. I mean, they don't know us. They don't know that we're not a mega church or, they're, you know, or that we're not independently wealthy. They just know they got a gift from people who are brothers and sisters in Christ somewhere in the world that love them. <coughs> the second point is that giving begins in the heart. You know, your attitude is, is the out, outworking of what's in your heart. So when we give with the right heart attitude, it has far-reaching effects for you and for others and for God's kingdom. The apostle tells us that there is a cause and effect relationship that results from our attitudes toward giving. He says, you know, and again, he uses an agrarian metaphor. I mean, this was a farming area too, so whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. You know, any of you have a garden? My son-in-law and my daughter, you know, they, they kind of did their garden for the first time ever, and they were all excited because they raised things, little seedlings, you know, and then they planted them out. And my son-in-law wanted to raise corn. Oh, he was all excited about this. I think he planted like six stalks of corn, you know. I wasn't going to disabuse him of anything because I knew it was going to happen. But, you know, he kind of tended this all through, the, you know, the summer, and he watered it, and he weeded it, and he fed them. And just when that corn was getting ripe, he goes out the next morning, and he's gone. <laughs> The raccoon was there during the night. He was watching it, too. <laughs> so if, if, if Stu wanted to have, you know, corn, he needed to put 20 rows in, you know. That's what I told him next year. So you don't sow sparingly if you want to have a good harvest, do you? If you give little, you're going to receive little in return. So we're talking not about farming, of course. We're talking about God's economy here. It's not the world's. If your heart isn't generous... You're not going to grow spiritually. That's where the harvest field is for God, is right here. When your heart is generous, you expand spiritually. So then he says, each should give what he has decided in his heart. Again, it's the heart attitude, right? To give. Not reluctantly, because, oh, I filled out that pledge card, and I'm sorry I pledged X amount to the church this week. I really want that money because I want to go buy a new dress at Macy's and so I just don't know. Maybe, you know. Nobody will know. Only Louise will know. Louise isn't here, right? So, um, and she'll never tell anybody because she's sworn to secrecy, by the way. Um, but God knows. God knows. So, if you agonize over how much and how often you give, you're not going to get that joy, are you? But when your heart is generous, you will. You're going to say, wow, Lord. Thank you for giving me the money this week that I had, you know, for you. Because I always write my first check to God, do you? I mean, I get paid monthly, right? First week in the month, my check goes in there. It's one twelfth of my pledge. Every single month, you know, I write that check, and boy, I have, I have everything left over that I need, and more. So, don't have a heavy heart about giving. You're really costing yourself... The real payoff about giving is that God invests in you the joy from his heart. And you feel, even though you don't hear the words, well done, my, da my daughter, my son, well done. Your generosity is going to give you joy. So 
So, so the third thing is, and God is able to make all grace abound in you. Don't you want to be a gracious person? Mm. Don't you want to, when, when, you, when you come into a room and people know your real character and they say, oh, Cheryl's here. I was so glad. I wanted to see Cheryl today. And, there she is. and my whole day has changed because Cheryl came into the room and the whole spiritual atmosphere has changed because Cheryl was there. <laughs> He's able to make all grace abound in you. Not just a little, it's, 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 it's coming out. You know, it's like oozing out of you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you're going to abound in every good work. When your heart's generous, God is able to give you what you need and use you as an instrument of his grace to others. Generosity actually eliminates many of the spiritual stumbling blocks that hold you back from receiving from God what he wants to give to you and how he wants to use you. Faith means trusting that God's going to provide not only all that you need, but even more so that your generosity can grow. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before the Lord on Judgment Day because we're all going to, you know, we're going to heaven. That's not a problem. We're, we're saved. You know, salvation is assured. You get that. So you're not going to have the judgment that others that don't know the Lord are going to have, the eternal judgment of being separated from God in hell. We're going to have the judgment of how we lived our lives for the Lord. Now I don't want to stand before the Lord and be ashamed. And have them say, well, Susan, you know, I gave you a lot. You could have done this, you could have done that, you could, but, you, but you just, you know, you chose to just do this. I want to stand before my Lord and have him say, yeah, I love you, my daughter. Come on up and sit in my lap. <laughs> Let me give you a hug and a kiss. That's what I want. That's worth more than anything you're ever going to have in your IRA account, I'll tell you that. Third point is that giving from your heart is going to point others toward the Lord. Now, isn't that our job? Didn't we promise? You know, when, when the Lord saved you, gave you the salvation of the cross, he has work for you to do. What's your work? What are we supposed to do? What's the great commission? Be my witnesses in the world, you know? doesn't say, you know, go as a missionary to Timbuktu. It's, the world is where God privileges you to be every day. That's the world for you, right? Be my witnesses. Because of the service by which you've proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. How are you doing on the confession of the gospel? Mm. And for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. So the generous disciple has a positive effect on other believers, helping them to grow in faith and pointing them to God. And of course, non-believers too. They're going to see, because you're obedient and you're cheerful in your giving, the work of God in you will have a good effect on them and others. In other words, you're going to be a conduit of God's grace. God's grace is going to shine right through you. So when Cheryl comes into the room, that grace is shining right out of her face. Your giving from your heart will have a positive effect on God's kingdom. You know, it's not just us here at Childerville Church. You know, I love coming here because we love each other. Don't, we? You know, don't, don't you get, you get lifted when you come here every week? And you leave and you say, yeah, things are pretty crappy out there, but you know what? I know next Sunday I'm going to be with my family. And we love each other. So what God does is far beyond what we're doing here right now. Your giving from your heart is going to have a positive effect for the kingdom. The service you perform is not only for supplying the needs of God's people, but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. And in their prayers for you, their hearts are going to go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given to you. So more and more people are going to be drawn to God through the gracious service and the gifts of his faithful stewards. It's an exponential effect, to put it mathematically. When we're generous-hearted disciples, we're going to be remembered in people's prayers. Wow, 
And we're going to bring pleasure to God as more people seek Him in prayer. You ever been going through a hard time and you see somebody you haven't seen for a while and say, I've been, I've been praying for you. Mm -hmm. How do you feel when they say that? Great. Mm -hmm. And somehow, a lot of times you know, because even though things are really going south in your life, you still have that feeling like, well, you know, it's, I think it's going to be okay. That's because you know about those prayers on a spiritual level, but you didn't know it was that person that was praying. Always tell people when you're praying for them. That's one of those gifts. Because Paul talks at the end about that kind of return. He said, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Mm -hmm. I've been standing up here talking about the gifts of giving, and they're not able to be described. What God does with the gifts that he gives to faithful believers provides an indescribable gift because the effect is grace for everyone, permeated with God's love through it all. And the heart response of a faithful follower of Jesus is thankfulness to God. And we're coming into the season of thankfulness. May our first thanks always be to our loving God. Our Heavenly Father, who knows all our needs and cares for each and every one of them. And also, may we, as we continue on to the season of Christmas, remember the gifts of giving and thank God for his indescribable gift, mm -hmm. our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for making each one of us with unique gifts and talents that not only enrich our lives and the lives of those whom we love, but bring such pleasure to you when we use